you, Lord. Thank 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 you, Lord. Satamango prosi karada kabar gestedi.
Thank you, Lord. There's none like you.
every church, in every. I just came from Kenya a few weeks. We were there a few weeks ago, and I never thought I'd see the day when the president and his wife would invite me to come and minister to the whole nation. I never thought it would ever happen. This only happened, I think, once before in my lifetime. Only once. And it wasn't even that big. Now you got a country like Kenya where a president who is a Christian and his wife, who is an intercessor, decide they need a healing for the nation. And when she came to invite me, she flew all the way from Nairobi in the fall of last year. And I'm sitting there wondering, like, why is this happening? And she said, we need to repent. I said, for what? For the way we treated men of God. That's what she said. And I was stunned, like, am I hearing this? She said, we need to repent as a nation. In the way we treated even you. I said, well, when I, we had a million people and I didn't feel I was mistreated. I didn't think about it. Nobody was mean or nasty that I remember. I remember what God did. I just don't remember anything else. And that was years ago. She said, Pastor Benny, God told us to have you come so the nation can ask you, ask you, and I did not know what to say. So on the last day, they said, would you forgive us publicly? I was not too comfortable doing that. You were there. And finally, I did, and I did in the pastor's meeting where 20,000 pastors gathered. We were only expecting 4,000. 20,000 showed up, and we had to go back to the stadium. And I'm thinking, Lord, why are you doing this? Why am I alive to see it? I should have died back in 2015. It didn't happen. Because I had a heart condition that could have killed me. And I'm thinking, I'm 71, and I'm here in this country, I'm in Kenya, and I'm looking at this incredible event. Now, what was so amazing wasn't so much the crowd. There were half a million people there. They used the, the stadium that seated 150,000 only because of security for the president so they could control the security. And I'm thinking, and I honestly tell you, I did not feel or want to pray for the sick. I just didn't sense that that's why I had me, God had me there. Okay, you can pray for the sick and a few would, would be healed, but then the rest of them are not sick. And I looked at that platform, three platforms, not just one, three of them. On the right sat all the preachers. Every name you can imagine was there. They, he sat almost right next to the president himself. All the officials, hundreds, each platform, I don't know how many on each platform, at least 200, 300 each on each platform. And I'm thinking, because they told us it was 600 altogether of guests on the platform, platforms. So I walk over to, because I just felt I need to, pray, and I pray for the preachers here, and then I went over there. 
And the power of God began hitting the officials. And the wife of the ambassador was ready for me to lay hands on her. But I thought I better wait. Because the next day I went and met with them for two hours. And what was amazing to me is he said, he said, you convicted me to read my Bible. Now that's not a preacher telling me. That's an ambassador telling me. Now, that was the next day in his office. And what was even more re remarkable, he said, would you minister to my staff? What? Including the rabbi who sat there. The staff was sitting, and they all came in, and I preached Jesus. Now, wait, wait. You know, you got to understand. We're talking about Jewish people. And a rabbi. And the rabbi seemed to enjoy it, I think. And there were other staff members who were not Jews, naturally, because they had people from Kenya there, too. But I'm thinking this is not exactly something that happens every day. But I'm here to tell you something, saints. And, I, and I, I'm not prophesying. I'm not saying thus as the Lord. I'm just speaking as someone who's been there for a while in ministry. I have never seen this before. And I thought to myself about the times I had gone to other countries. Uh, I was invited, for example, to Indonesia. And the government paid for the crusade. But that was years ago. A Muslim government paid for the crusade. And I thought that was something big too. Now I'm thinking this is bigger. Way bigger. And I don't want to say any, any more to you except you can sense something that triggered in the atmosphere. Especially when they all prayed at the end. Here's the president on his knees, his wife on her knees, officials on their knees, asking God to bless their life. And, and since then, I've been invited now to go to Uganda for the same thing. The wife of the president was on her knees the day I was preaching in Kenya, sent me a message, and she said, you tell Benny, and I'm on my knees praying, he'll come here now. So is this the beginning, maybe, of the transformation to begin and restoration to begin in Africa? Will God use Africa? Is that his plan, to use Africa to literally ignite a new move of the Spirit? I think so. How many of you believe that? That Africa may very well be the continent that will ignite the world with the power of God. Is it possible that God has a bigger plan for Nigeria than you even know about? Is it possible that God will have or already has a bigger plan for Tanzania? Because they came from all over Africa. Pastors and people came from all over. They told me that publicly. They said they've come from every country in Africa. And I'm thinking, Lord, why are you doing this now? While the world is about to enter the most dangerous moment in history. I mean, who thought we would hear about nuclear war? Repeatedly now. It's just not one thing you hear. You're, you're hearing it more than once. Any of the troubles out there, whether it's the Ukraine or Russia or Iran or North Korea that has just now, their leader 
is preparing for war. It said so yesterday in the news. Or the situation with, with Israel or Gaza. Anything can trigger that in no time. The world is on edge as never before. Well, here's what the book of Isaiah said. Gross darkness will cover the earth first. And then gross darkness will cover the people of the earth. These are two separate events. Gross darkness will cover the earth and then the people of the earth. I have a friend, a pastor, John Kilpatrick. He's a man of God. He had a vision a few days ago, a very powerful one. And he was telling me about it. He actually came to be with us a few weeks ago. We had a celebration. Uh, my children, Michael and Jessica, have a big ministry now called Jesus Image. And they just had their big conference. 10,000 people at least were there. And John came, Pastor John. And in the back, he was telling me about his vision that God showed him that the earth is now responding in pain to the sins of humanity. What he said was how when Adam sinned, the earth began to feel the pain of his sin because God said now the, the, the earth will no longer bring forth. You have to plow it. So the earth responds negatively to the sins of humanity. And it was quite powerful what he said. He said, these, these events on earth now, because of the sins of men that have increased so greatly, the earth will, will respond with greater earthquakes, greater troubles, manifestations in the weather, and such things. Well, I mean, these things have happened already. We've all seen the effects. Uh, I went through two, two hurricanes, two already in Florida. It, it's not pleasant at all. I live by the ocean. Those waves were so massive, it was mandatory evacuation twice. I, I never have seen the ocean so violent as I saw during that hurricane. I thought for sure it's going to be all right. It wasn't. Mandatory. We had to leave because of flooding. And I never thought I'd see such wrath, rage hit those waves. Pastor Tom, I, I've lived by the ocean for years. I was born in Jaffa. I never saw that. I lived in California on the Pacific Ocean, right on the shore or close to it. I never saw that. But last year, those waves were beyond massive and violent winds to the place. And it wasn't even the eye of the hurricane or close to it. So the world is going to experience more of it. And possibly this year, I don't want to scare you. But possibly this year, unless we pray, unless we pray, and Global Day of Prayer is coming up this Friday and Saturday, unless we pray, there could be something that will trigger, God forbid, but we have to believe God, it won't happen, between China and the United States. Something could be triggered on the oceans of, of, of the world. The, the, the situation with, with Taiwan is on edge. So why am I saying this? Well, because the Bible says gross darkness will cover the earth and then gross darkness will cover the people of the earth before the coming of the Lord. But what does it say to the, to the church? It says the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord will be seen upon you. So on one hand, great light in the church, 
On the other hand, great darkness, gross darkness. And God will, will, will literally produce equally the light. As the darkness gets deeper, the glory will get greater. Equally, equally. Remember that when God brought Israel out of Egypt, the Egyptians saw what? Darkness. And the Jewish people saw light because they always come together. And this year, I, you know, we haven't been here since 2019. This is 2024. And now we're back together again. Could it be that God Almighty has arranged it this way? To prepare you, the church, for what God will do this year, not next year? This year. I don't believe in Nostradamus. I, I, I don't believe he's a man of God. I don't believe he was. But some of his prophecies are now being republished about 2024. I don't know. He was accurate on some stuff. Some he wasn't. But he said two things will happen in 2024. We'll, we'll, we'll watch and see. Number one, that the Pope will abdicate. The present Pope will leave his place in 2024. Secondly, that he said the King of England will also abdicate. He said that. He wrote that. I saw it on the news. I don't read Nostradamus. I am intrigued by what that man said. Whether he's from the devil or from God, only God knows that. Now let's see if the Pope this year will leave the papacy. Let's see if King Charles will no longer be king after this year. But I don't care what the man said. I care what the Bible says. Because the word, and I said that to get your attention, because some of you are falling asleep. Not you. I'm talking to them. If you, if you ever fall asleep on me, I would take my bottle of water and splash your face and wake you up. You shall not. That's very good. I want to wake them up. They are asleep spiritually. You are asleep. Some of you, you are spiritually asleep on the edge of eternity. You are drowsing off on the edge of eternity. Be careful. I'm not here to raise money. I'm here to wake you up. And if you don't wake up, you're a fool. Because you see it all around you. Look what's happening all around you. I don't care if you like me or not. If you don't, it doesn't, it's not going to affect me one bit. I know who I am. I just want to warn you because I don't want your blood on my hands. Wake up. It's time to awake out of sleep, Paul wrote. Get your knees all strong again. And let's get moving for the king of heaven. You sang, and you, we heard the beautiful words of the song you sang earlier. You're holy, Lord. You're wonderful. You're great. Well, he is to us. Now, in some places in the church, people are asleep. Now, I asked a question earlier. When did God bless Israel? On the way out. And I'm here to tell you, we're about to leave. We're about to go home. We're about to be with the Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Lift your hands and say it. 
One more time. With all your heart, one more time. That's our cry. That's the cry of the church. So God Almighty does not want you leaving this world defeated or lacking. Now you have to ask yourself another question. What did God give Israel on the way out and why? Why? Well, he gave them the wealth of the Egyptians. Now, people will mock that. Say, well, what has this got to do with God's plan? Oh, it has a lot to do with God's plan. Because God gave them the wealth of the Egyptians to build his house, his tabernacle. And before we leave, we have got to begin building for the kingdom in a way we've never built for the kingdom before. We have to increase and enlarge our vision. We have to enlarge our capacity of faith. So Moses built the tabernacle. And all the gold that was used in it came out of Egypt. All the silver came out of Egypt. All the jewelry came out of Egypt. Everything came out of Egypt. All the animals for sacrifice came out of Egypt. And people don't think about how powerful the miracle was where God kept the animals alive for 40 years in a desert. In a desert. We hear about the water coming you know, coming out of the rock for the people. But how about the cattle? In their hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions. We, we, we know six million came out with Moses, that's people. But how about animals? How many animals? If you just would think about the offerings they gave daily, daily, the daily offerings of animals, it would fill 12 semis a day. You know, you see those big trucks on the highways? 12 would, those animals would fill 12 of them every day because the people brought their sacrifices to God because God said, I want two lambs in the morning and two in the evening. I want oxen. I want goats. I want birds. I want meat offerings, meaning bread. I was, I was amazed when I began studying the five offerings mentioned in Leviticus. Five of them. Each one is the Lord. Quite powerful. And Israel had to offer all that daily. Forty years of it. And think about all the animals that were offered because someone sinned. Out of six million, there's a lot of sinning going on. And they all had to bring their, their animals. Those priests were busy day and night. The fire on the altar of sacrifice didn't go out day and night. Twelve semis? How did they stay alive? We have a big God. So what are you worried about? Nothing. Lift your hand and say, I have a big God. Say it again. Say it again. Now say, I will not settle for a cupful when the ocean belongs to me. Say it again. Say it again. Ah, don't forget that. He promised us the ocean. He didn't promise us just a cup. The ocean. There was a friend who did not know what the ocean looked like. And a friend of his said, I'll show you. I heard that story from Catherine Kuhlman. Two friends. One lived by the ocean and one had never seen the ocean. 
So the friend that lived by the ocean said to the friend that never saw the ocean, I will show you what the ocean looked like, looks like. So he took a cup from his house and went down to the ocean and put some of the ocean in the cup and took it to his friend who lived miles away. He said, this is the ocean. It wasn't the ocean. It was only a cup full. That's how some of you are living. You've never seen the ocean. It's yours, though. You've never seen, because all you've seen is a cup full of salt water from the ocean. Lift your hands and say, Lord, I'm ready for, for the ocean. I don't want no cups no more. Say, say, I don't want any more cups. I want the ocean. Well, that's what's coming. Hello, did you hear me? That's what's coming. We have seen cupfuls of prosperity. Now the ocean is on the way. Because it's coming before the coming of the Lord. So God kept them blessed in Egypt. He gave them cucumbers and he gave them leaves and fish and all that they ate. That's just cup here and cup there. But before they left the land, God gave them the ocean. He said, go and spoil the Egyptians. Now, Egypt was the greatest superpower of the day. More money, more wealth in Egypt in those days than any country on earth. But who took it all? The church. Why? To build a tabernacle. To glorify the Lord, to build his house. What did Jacob say to the Lord? He said, Lord, if you'll, if you'll go with me and bring me back, I'll give you 10%. And I'll build you your house. This place, Bethel, will be your house, which became God's house later. It became the center of ministry besides Gilgal in the nation of Israel. Samuel would go to, to Bethel regularly. It was where Jacob made the vow. Now, God Almighty is about, and I said all I said earlier to let you know, the time. This is high time. This is great high time for us to wake up and realize there's coming a mighty move of God. Greater than you'll ever know. Ever know. Leaders from around the world will be calling upon men and women of God to come and pray for them. They have no answers. They have no answers. Years ago, there was a man out of Miami, very powerful, influential man, who took me to Washington twice. He had helped Ronald Reagan become president. His name was Bob, and for some reason, he and I connected. So he said to me, he said, I want you to come with me and meet all the senators in Washington. I, I, I didn't believe that he could do it, but boy, did he ever. So I walk into the office of a senator named Snow, or last name is Snow, and I, I literally, he opened the whole Congress to me and the Senate. I went in and, and prayed with every congressman he knew and you name it and all of them. And the senator says to me, a lady, Senator Snow, she says, how refreshing it is you've come to ask for nothing. You just come to pray for me. How refreshing. They all said that to me. Because they thought I was going to come and ask for some favor. Uh -uh. I said, I'm just coming to pray with you. I never thought I would see such response from people who were not exactly born again, but who wanted prayer. Wanted prayer. And they were so grateful and thanked me for praying for them. I think the day is coming. We're going to see invitations coming our way from presidents, prime ministers, royal families to go and pray with them because they have no answers. 
The world today is at a place of such confusion and darkness and fear, they don't know what to do because they don't know what they're doing already. Nothing is working. And the church is the answer to the world's problems. And if we do not do our job, God will judge us. Because this is an hour as never before. Elisha stood with the king of Israel who was not exactly righteous and said, shoot those arrows. And the man didn't shoot as many as he should have. And he rebuked him for his disobedience. But he did win three battles, didn't he? Because of the man of God. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to prophesy something. I don't believe that Pastor Chris is on this property by accident. I believe God gave him this property for something bigger than he knows and bigger than you know. With all our frailties, for we are human beings, with all our frailties, God is bigger than any man. And he will use us as we are to accomplish his will for the nations. I said for the nations. For his name's sake. For his name's sake. I was told by Pastor Tom and then Pastor Chris told me, and I somewhat forgot that the last time I was here, I prophesied about this property. Well, it's happening. But I'm here to tell you, it's a bigger plan than you all know. Because God is about to literally open the heavens over our lives. Are you, are you listening? Are you ready for it? Well, then you, you need to get your faith equal with that. Remember, I just said, the ocean is yours. Say that. Say it again. Say it again. Well, get there by faith. Get there. Don't just say it. Believe it. Believe it. Begin to believe it. A man of God named Fred Roberts in 82 in South Africa told me, he said, God's going to use you in the last days to prepare the church for the coming of the Lord. I did not really believe it then. I began to, to believe it later. But at that time, I wasn't uh, seeing it. I thought he was being nice. He wasn't being nice. He was prophesying. A man of God named Fred Roberts, he was an apostle in Durban, South Africa. Established many churches in South Africa. And today I'm thinking, he told me that. And others like him. I didn't really see it like I see it now. In the late 70s, I walked into a house in Jerusalem. I went with friends of mine from the catacombs. I wasn't in the ministry yet. I wasn't preaching yet. The Watsons took us and two friends from the catacombs said, we want to introduce you to this lady who is a prophetess. Never even heard her name. They had just evacuated the, the embassies out of Jerusalem. Nations were leaving Jerusalem and moving to Tel Aviv. Embassies were moving out of Jerusalem. So a lot of embassies became available for sale. Because prior to that, the embassies of the world were in Jerusalem. And now with all the political chaotic stuff, they began leaving and going to Tel Aviv. So this woman, with her ministry, bought or leased one of the embassies. So I walked to, the, to this door. 
And with me is my friend David and his wife, Lisa Loden. The man's name was David Loden and Lisa Loden. I'll never forget them. And they, they wrote some songs years ago that the church sang, Hebraic songs. So I walk to that big door, and there stands this woman, tall, white shoulders. And before she said anything, thus says the Lord. That's how she started. Didn't even say hello. Named Ruth Heflin. Ruth Heflin was her name. Thus says the Lord, I will bring you before kings and presidents and prime ministers. You will preach to millions. And then she said, what's your name? That's how she started. What's your name? I, I, I was shocked. I, 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 I forgot what my name was. <laughs> she said, thus is the Lord. I, for, I forgot all about me. And everything she said happened. I was, I was 20 or somewhere there, years of age. Dear Ruth Heflin. She became my friend later, but I was, I was stunned by that woman. But she prophesied on my life, but I didn't see it. I never thought I could even be in the presence of a president. I would have been all tied up. I thought, what king? I don't know. I walked into the palace of King Hussein of Jordan years ago. I'm friends with his son, who's the king now. He had me preach in Amman and gave me his soldiers to protect me. I was the first preacher to ever preach the gospel at the palace of culture in Amman with 5,000 people that came. And the king of Jordan gave me permission. And now his son, Abdullah, I gave him the Bible. I said, you're, you're in the Bible. He said, where? I opened Isaiah 16. I said, here, it mentions you in Isaiah 16. He was stunned. But that woman knew it. And I'm here telling you, the ocean is coming your way. <laughs> Will you believe that? I didn't believe it when she said what she said. But I'm telling you now, I'm 71, I'm not 20 anymore. The ocean is coming your way. God's mighty ocean. Lift your hands and say, Lord, I'm ready. The blessings that are coming your way cannot be described. You people better stop praying in tongues right here, right now. Come on, I want to hear you. The glory of God cannot and will not be described. It cannot be. It's greater than your faith. You don't even have enough faith to see it or believe it. Greater, much greater than your faith. This is what it says, exceeding abundantly above all we ask or even think to ask. That's what's coming. You have to expect it. You have to believe it. It's time. Lord, we praise you. It's coming. Lift your hands and say, Lord, I praise you. It's coming my way. Come on, say, Lord, I praise you. It's coming my way. Your wave of blessing. The ocean itself, full of your glory. Hallelujah. The Bible says that the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the oceans cover the sea. God's glory is coming your way. But if you miss it, it's your fault. Sit down. What do we do to be ready? Well, first of all, we seek the Lord. Get to know his word in, in, in a way you've never known the word of God. Get to really know his mind through scripture. This is where it all begins. God is about 
to give you a gift you've never had. D did you hear that? The Lord is about to give you a gift you've never known. If I walked over to Bishop here, this Bishop here, and said, God told me to give you a new car, he'd be a happy man. He, he'll, he'll rejoice. God has promised us life eternal. It's a gift. But if I gave this man a car, it, it's no good without gasoline. Now, I give him the car, but he better get the gas. God gives us a gift. We find the gas. Without the gas, the car is no good. Without the gas, the gift is no good. You can have a car brand new in the garage. Somebody gives you a car brand new, the keys with it, but it, it, it's no good till you go to the gas station. And the gas will not come to you. You have to go and find it. God gave us the gas. It's his word. The gasoline is his word. And it will not show up in your tent. Go find it. God said to Israel, I'm going to send you manna. But it will not show up in your tent. Go find it out there. They had to leave their tent, their comfort zone, go out to the desert where it's hot and dry and find the manna. We have a job. Let's go get the gas. God is sending you a gift you've never known. You talk about prosperity, oh, come on. It's way bigger than that. It's way bigger than that. Your fridge will be full of food without you going shopping. Your bank account will have money without you even putting it in. What are you talking about? You say, well, that's impossible. Well, there, that's where you are. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. The same God that took a lunch from a boy and fed the multitudes with it, don't you think he can do it again? The God that filled, filled Jerusalem with food in a night, the famine broke. Elisha said, it's going to happen. And the Syrians left with their tents full. And a city almost dead with famine, the next morning had everything they needed and more. All the gold, all the silver, all the food. It was in every tent because God said it's all yours. What did God give Israel? Come on. He gave them a land that wasn't theirs. Seven nations. He said, I'm going to give you farms you haven't sown in, houses you haven't built. And it happened. Where is your faith? Where is your faith? Is it in God or in business? Is it in God or in you? Is it in God or your preacher? It's in God. Nothing is impossible with God. Not to God, with God. With God means he needs a partner. You better get it. It doesn't say nothing is impossible to God. It says with God. Meaning God needs someone to agree with him. Ah, you got it. Will you agree with him? All right. God needs a partner. He needs someone to say, yes, Lord, use me. I am the vessel. Use me. Do it through me. And I'm there for you, and I'm there with you. Oral Roberts used to say, God will not, will not do it without you. And you cannot do it without him. Say, God will not do it without me. Say it again. Lift your hands, say it again in your home. God will not do it without me. And say, I cannot do it without him. So it's coming. 
Prosperity is small in comparison to what's coming. I think when we think of prosperity, we think something down to my level. My bills paid, whatever. God says, forget your level. You're about to swim in it. I'm serious. You're about to swim in it. No limit. Say no limit. No limit to his blessings. No, not whatsoever. No limit. The only people who put the limit is you. Take the limits off. Take the limits off. Hello, no limit. Say no limit. But he's got to trust you. He's got to trust you. God could not have trusted me with Kenya 10 years ago. I, oh, of course, I had to prove myself faithful to him. God cannot give you a nation if you're not faithful enough to prove yourself. You have to show yourself worthy of trust. And that happens when you serve, when you give, when you do what's expected of you. I'm not talking about money. And if anybody, anyone thinks I am, you're the problem, not me. You've got the problem. I don't have it. I'm talking about something so big. It's way bigger than money. What are you talking about? I am talking about God's plan. God's plan now for your tomorrow, for your future. Bigger than anything that has to do with anything earthly. Or bills being paid or all that. That's just, that's little stuff. Little stuff. He's able to do what now? One more time. What? Wait, wait, wait. Exceedingly? Abundantly above what we... Wait, above what? Oh. You know, Paul talks about the exceeding greatness of God's power towards us who believe. Say the exceeding greatness of his power. Say it again. Towards who? Towards who? Now, now, let me just give you a little, a little idea here. Corruption's all around you. Dangers around you. Corruption's within you. Dangers within you. Now, two years ago, A year ago, excuse me, I went through those hurricanes. Now, Bishop Clarence McClendon, I don't think you've ever been in a hurricane, maybe an earthquake. But if I held the candle on that day and I stood out there with those winds blowing at 80 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour that caused that ocean to become violent. That an order was released of mandatory evacuations. If I stood out there with that candle and that candle stayed lit, I'd say that's the power. I'd say that's a miracle. That the storms could not put that candle off. There's a candle inside of you. And there's more forces at work in and outside of you, bigger and stronger than any hurricane. Yet the light is still light. It's still shining. Who's, who's, who's keeping it? Who's behind it? God Almighty. If I took that candle in my hand last year and went into the ocean itself, and it was on the water, and it stayed lit, I'd say, that's a miracle. You are surrounded by an ocean of evil. You're surrounded by an evil 
dark ocean all around you, yet that light is still shining. He is, he's promised us that he is the power that is keeping us. For it says, exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Hear me now. It took more power to save you. More power at work in your life today. And more, dear God, I'm about to shout. And more power to transform you into the image of Christ than the power it took to create the world. When God created Adam, he went from dust to dust. But when God created you, the church, he is turning dust into his likeness. Whoa, my. Think about what I'm saying. All the power that God used on Adam did not change him into his likeness. He went from dust to dust. He said, from dust you are to dust you're going back. But you and me, the power at work in our lives is greater than the power that created the world. Greater than the power that created man. Because dust to dust, that's limited power. But the exceeding riches of his power towards us, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is about to transform this piece of dust into the image of Christ Jesus. That's power. Lift your hands and thank you for what's coming your way. And you're talking about money? Are you kidding? We're talking about power that is at work in us now. Transforming us day by day into the image of his son. And you're worried about your bills to be paid? What level of faith is that? That's below zero faith. Get out of there. And start believing for bigger things. Lift your hands say, the ocean is coming my way. Say it again. Not a couple, but the ocean. God has promised us. Now, you know, I think when we talk prosperity, we go to low levels. We go to much low levels because it's about natural things. But God wants us to go beyond that. Beyond that. The disciple says, Lord, uh, there's thousands of people here. Uh, how can you feed them with just a lunch? He saw more than that. His faith was way higher than theirs. Oh, here's Moses standing, the ocean in front, the Egyptians behind him. In the natural, it, 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 you think he's trapped. The nation of Israel said, we're doomed. The Egyptians behind us, the ocean before us, we're going to drown or die. But Moses did not see the Egyptians or the ocean. He saw God. He was in the spirit, higher level faith. Are you, are you listening? He saw the Lord. And by faith, that ocean split. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? You're with me. David did not see the valley, he saw the Lord. What are you looking at? The Lord or the, or the valley? Lift your hands and say, Lord, increase my faith. Come on, remove the scales of my eyes. Take it off, Lord. I don't want to see anymore in the, that limited world of mine. It's way bigger, way bigger than you and I. Way bigger than you and I. You all know the story. In the book of Numbers, they went in the promised land. Oh, there's giants. We look like grasshoppers. Really? No, we're the giants. We're the giants. So we were grasshoppers, it says. They said because of their lack of faith. We were as grasshoppers in their sight and our sight. Look, the way you see yourself is the way the devil sees you. 
Did you hear that? Say the way I see myself is the way the devil sees me. Well, be free from that grasshopper mentality. Well, we saw giants and we all looked like, ah, uh -uh, no, no more, no more. You'll lend and not borrow. You're the head and not the tail. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Say, Lord, I am the head. Say, I am the head. I am the head. Don't you lower yourself to become the president of any country. Don't you lower yourself to become the president of any nation. You hold a higher position than any king on earth. I will not lower myself to become the king of England. He can have it. I serve the king of kings. The Lord of lords. Not some government or kingdom or monarchy. I have a higher place than any man on earth. Why? I'm serving the Lord. I'm serving the Lord. Predestined before the foundation of the world. Chosen in him before the God in heaven. Before the foundation of the world. To be holy and blameless before him in love. God has set his heart upon you. He calls you his treasure. I said he calls you his treasure. Say I am his treasure. Say I am his treasure. Then don't worry about the little things. You are his inheritance and he's your inheritance. Did you hear that? He is your inheritance and you are his inheritance. An inheritance demands what? What? Death. You cannot receive an inheritance till someone dies. And God said, I give you an inheritance. And he died for it. Who am I? You have an inheritance bigger than you'll ever know. Say, all is mine. Lift your hands, say, all is mine. One more time. Do you believe it? That's what it says in the Bible. All is yours. No limit. Say no limit. Yes. Why are you limiting God? Because you live in low levels of faith. I haven't even gotten to my message. I just want you to change your vision. Whew. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord will not lack nothing. Read Psalm 34:10 for me. Come on, let's go. Let's get into some of a part of what I was planning on saying. And then you're next. You, you, you're going to take that thing over, brother. Yay! The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want shall not want any good thing. Your inheritance is way bigger than money. Way bigger than paying your bills and buying a house. Yes, yes. All these things are natural things. Yeah. One day you're going to own the world. You're going to judge angels. Are you listening? Yeah. You're going to judge the world and the angels. Seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, the older I get, the more I believe in predestination. But not predetermination. We all are responsible before God. When you realize God has set his heart Upon you, before the foundation of the world, you become very determined to finish well. I don't know if you heard what I said. When you say to yourself, he loves me that much, 
that he loved me before the world was formed. He set his heart on me before he created angels. The world. He knew my name. Before all that, I better serve him well. I will not fail such love. I will not walk away from such love. It's not about today's world. This is only a test. Look, giving is about what God can trust you with tomorrow. I mean eternity. Everything we do on earth is a test. Our serving, our loving, our worship, our giving, it's all a test. You think God will give you the invisible if you are not trusted with the visible? That's what Jesus said in Luke. If you cannot be trusted with the filthy mammon, who will trust you with real riches, true riches? True riches are not money. That's the invisible, magnificent promises of God coming our way. Money is simply how much can God trust you with tomorrow? With the visible, God can tell what you can do with the invisible. My giving determines my position and my living in eternity. It's about trust. And Jesus said, if you cannot be trusted with that filthy mammon, who will trust you with true riches? He wasn't talking about money when he said true riches. He meant position. More than that. Hallelujah. Psalm 115 verse 14. You know, money is only an expression of faith. If you cannot give God your money, you have not given him your heart. Because when you give him your heart, everything else is his. Everything is his. But these people who attack us focus on the money, the money, the money. That's low thinking. That's not thinking right. We are on a higher level than that. Don't insult us by bringing us down to your level. I never think about money. I think on how will I finish. And I have decided to finish stronger than I began. I will not enter heaven to be ashamed. Because he gave me enough to hold on to. I have enough in, the, in, in Scripture that promises me what I will have if I do what God has commanded me to do in this life. In this life. Paul in, in 2 Corinthians talks about the treasure that awaits when we give. Same in Philippians. That word receive is receipt in Philippians. When he talks about giving and receiving, the word receiving is receipting. Every time you give, God gives you a receipt for what you're going to get in eternity. You can't buy it. Only a fool believes that. It's an expression, an act of faith. It's all it is on our part. So in Psalm 115 verse 14, it says, The Lord will increase you more and more. That means no limit to the increase. And your children, if they'll serve him. Yeah. Now, 
Let's, let's look at Deuteronomy 28, 12 and 13. The Lord will open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto your land in his season, to bless all the work of your hand. And you lend unto what? Nations. Not just people. Nations. You lend to many nations. That's big stuff. Wow. That's on a level we haven't seen yet, have we? So everything you do today is a test. You're being tested. Well, we're at the end of our journey, saints. We're at the end of the race, some of us, like me. This whole world is about to come to an end. It may be this year. Come, Lord Jesus. So God can do something very quickly with you if you will do the right thing. Romans 12, verse 1 and verse 2. Pastor Dan, would you read that for me, please? I beseech you, I therefore. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. That's it. By the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How amazing that worship includes the physical world. Our bodies. We are to present our bodies to God. Read that again, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that, that ye present your body as what? A living sacrifice. Holy. Holy acceptable, acceptable unto, unto God. Which is what? Your reasonable service. Now, that means worship. Now, your finances. People don't understand how important God sees that. Because, again, you're in the test. You're, 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 you're being tested with what can God trust you with in eternity? Your service includes your giving. Because your giving represents your time, represents your strengths, represents your talents, and your inheritance. So John said, I wish above all things you prosper, be in health even as your soul. Physically, spiritually, and financially. So if you fail, if you are defeated, or you get frustrated, that's not God's will for your life. Can we go to Matthew 6, 24, please? Let's read that. You know, I'm bringing you down to your level because I want to show you that this is only the testing ground for the greater, for the much greater. Don't cling on to what is natural. It's not where you're going. You're going much higher than that. Are you people listening? Yes, sir. You see, everything I do, everything I do, at my age now, I think about how does God view what I'm doing and how will it affect my position in eternity? Because when you get to the end of your race, that's what you think about. How will I finish? And then you, th you think about the, the, the times you've wasted and you ask God to help you catch up. Redeem the time. Don't blow it. Be careful. This is not something to play with. It's your life and eternal position and eternal destiny. So, Matthew 6, 24, please. 
No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, mammon, by the way, has nothing to do with money. Mammon is the evil power that grips an individual, enslaving that individual through the medium of money. Money is neither good or bad. Money is money. Money is money. It's only paper or coins, whatever currency you're using. It's how you use it. What do you do with it? Because your attitude towards money reveals your attitude towards the Lord. I repeat, you're in a test. This life is a test. What are you doing with your time, your talents, your inheritance, your life? It's a test. What's important to you? God's work or your children's future? God's work or your business? You're taking nothing with you, brother. Naked you've come and naked you're going. So stop it. Think about what I'm talking about. People spend their energy and they become so connected and so a part of the norm and the natural stuff, it's sickening to watch. Oda Roberts and Evelyn Roberts were telling me about a lady who was their neighbor. Now, the lady that cleaned their house also cleaned their neighbor's house. So they lived in Newport Beach, California, in a very simple apartment. Oda Roberts had a simple life when he was old. Nothing big, nothing great. Just a little apartment they lived on, they lived in, in Newport Beach. But not far from their home was a big mansion a few miles down the road. And in the mansion lived this woman who went to Italy repeatedly to buy statues, statues of whatever statues they were. So this lady, when she was young and energetic, she'd fly to Italy to buy statues of all kinds of whoever they were, people, and other things, statues, flowery statues and Animal statues, just statues. And, and, and she came one day and because she used to clean the, the statues for her, for her whatever boss she worked for. So she came to see Oral and Evelyn. She said, you know, this morning I saw something really strange. The lady that had been buying statues all her life, guys, all her life, as she got older, she uh, could not walk. So she had to be on a wheelchair. And she had this lady, this lady who cleaned her house, wheel her every morning because she was checking the statues, checking them. So the day came when, when she was getting older and she knew she was very ill about to die. So she says to the lady who cleaned her house, who told Oral and Evelyn what happened that day because she cleaned the big house in the morning and Oral and Evelyn's apartment in the afternoon. She said, you won't believe what happened this morning. She said, well, I've been wheeling that lady on her wheelchair every morning to check to make sure everything is right, no cracks in those statues that she spent all her money on. But that morning she was kissing them. She asked the lady, would you help me up out of my wheelchair, kissing every statue. And she was crying as she's kissing this marble, whatever statue. 
And there were hundreds of them down this ho long hallway. Long hallway, Bishop. She said two, three hundred statues in that house down the hallway. And she wanted to kiss every one of them. And she was crying, kissing them. And she said to the lady who was helping her, who was pushing the wheelchair and helping her up every time to kiss another statue. Oh, she said, oh, I, how I wish I can take them with me. Because she was dying. How I wish I can take them with me. I'm going to miss my statue. Crying. Oh, my, how blind people are. So she comes to Oral and Evelyn, and she tells them that story. She says, I saw this woman today weeping, hugging and kissing her statues, pleading if there's any way she can take them with her into the grave. Aha, uh -huh, my. That's how you, some, some of you are. You want to hold on to all your money, all your treasures, all your wealth. How foolish you've been. God is requiring your soul. Who then will take all that money you've spent your life on building? All the business and all the nonsense you've spent your life building. You're leaving naked, brother. And I mean empty, in and out. We're not leaving empty. What you do for Christ will last. Only what you do for him, you'll take with you. Are you listening? Only what you do for him has life and meaning. Not the statues, not the business, not the house. Your son or your daughter will take it over or they'll fight over it most likely. And you're going to lose it all. I am shocked. I am beyond shocked when I hear how a family fights over the inheritance of a mommy or a daddy who died. They go to court. They become bitter enemies over possession. Who's got the will? Who, who, who's got the money? Ah, how blind they are. Uh -uh. We are in the book. That's the will. What you do for Jesus will last. Not for yourself. And giving to God is our expression, Lord, we're not tied up with this nonsense. Can I say it again? Every time you give, you say, I'm free from this. Are you, are you hearing me? Every time I give, I say, I'm not connected to this. Stuff. I, th this means nothing to me. Let's praise him for this. Come on. The freedom we have. You see how bound they are to their statues, to their mansions, their money, their bank accounts, that their families fight over it. They begin hearing each other for dollars. Who's getting the mullah? Who's getting the money? Not about God. Not about eternity. Not, not about what God will trust you with. You can be you are not going to be trusted with nothing, for you have wasted your life on nothing, less than nothing. All your oil, business, your houses, your bank accounts, below zero. It's not even zero, it's below zero. Only what you do for Christ will last. He will not be all to you till he is all you have. The richest people in the world are poor. 
Without Jesus, they're poor. But the poorest people with Jesus are rich. Where do you stand? <sighs> Seek ye first what? Come on, Matthew 6, 33, please. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And? And all these things. Now, you know, I'm really getting into your, inside of you guys. And you too, I hope. Because I, I, I've lived long enough to see this nonsense. Pastor Chris, I walked into the house of a man who owned all the malls in, Southern, in South Florida. A friend of mine named Bill Swad asked me to go pray for him. Pastor Dan, I walked into this mansion, and I mean palatial mansion. Palatial. Black marble, pink marble, you name, all the, the beautiful colors on the floor. And the butler opens the door. The man who owned all the malls of South Florida, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, all that, was dying with cancer. So I was asked to pray. So I went to see this man, and I see this very beautiful woman coming to greet me. Young woman. Maybe in her late 20s. I'm thinking she's the daughter. But. She was the wife of the man. So I walk in. I see this old man laying on the couch, skin and bones, skin and bones. So Bill Swart said that the, the family wanted me to pray for the man. That man was so drugged on medicine, he did not even know that I was there. He didn't even know I was there. So I walk in, and the first thing I'm thinking, is he going to hell or heaven? He was dead already, almost. So I did this. I said, sir, I, I was actually quite loud. Sir, do you know Jesus? And, and all he could do is, ah. he, he could not even talk. Ah, the lady, his wife, his young wife, and you know why she married him, does this to me. She says, that's not what he needs. I said, I know what I'm doing, lady. Sir, and the whole time she's tapping me. She wanted me to lay hands on him and fix him all up. You know, he was gone already. Sir, do you know Jesus? I'm thinking the guy is about to die. He did not even respond. He says, ah. I walked out of that house. I said, Bill. Bill Swad was with me. I said, Bill, all the money he's got means nothing. I said, that pretty girl will probably get it all. That's probably why she married him anyways in the first place. Come on, let's be real, brother. Why would a young girl that pretty marry an old guy like that? Mula. That's all they do it for. It's not love. It's greed. No way to explain. There's no other way to describe it. I'm thinking, all that money he spent his entire life building those malls, and now he's dying. He looked terrible with bones and skin on top. <gasps> How sad. Only for Jesus. Say it. Only for Jesus. So seek ye first what? The kingdom of God and his righteous cause. And all these things. Dear God, I feel the anointing just saying it. And all these things shall be added unto you. In Colossians 3 5, it says that idolatry is forbidden. Read that for me. Colossians 3, verse 5. Fortify therefore your members which are upon the earth fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil 
and covetousness, Covet which is idolatry. idolatry. You know, when people want money, it's as bad as fornication. Uh -huh. <laughs> what says? It says so. It says, mortify your members on the earth, fornication, anything unclean, anything that is not pure in your affections, anything evil, and covetousness is in that same line. Which is what? Idolatry. Some people don't worship God. They just worship money. Money is their God. You're as evil as one who is sleeping with women every day. Because you're, you, you are worshiping money. They worship their sin. They don't give it up. They spend their money on it. They love it. You know how you can tell a Christian from a non-Christian? The believer hates his sin. The unbeliever loves it. That's, that's the headline. You can assure yourself of salvation when you hate your sin. Anyone who hates his sin, it means God is in you working. Helping you hate it and not want it. And the first thing you do is say, I'm sorry, Lord, and you repent like this. They don't repent. They keep doing it. So in the Bible, it says very clearly, run away from it, that covetousness. Let's go to Psalm 96, and then I'm done. I can go on, but I, I, you're next. I think I've worked quite good today. Now, now you, you better do better, brother. You better go higher than me. Psalm, Psalm, 90, <laughs> Psalm 96, verse 8 and 9, brother. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering. Ah, uh, yeah, wait a minute now. Read it again. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. How? Bring an offering and come into his courts. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So, Fear before him. So giving, giving to the Lord brings him glory. You're, you're, you're not giving to bring yourself glory. You're not giving to build your future and your mansions and your bank accounts. You're giving to glorify him. That's the big difference with giving. And secondly, giving enables you to come properly into the courts. Read it again. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. And then. Bring a show offering and wait, come wait, into his stop, courts. Stop, stop, Where did that Okaba show come from, brother? <laughs> did, 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 <laughs> did you just re read the Okaba show in there? I got excited about it. Got excited about my offering. Okay, would you please read the English and forget that go reba. <laughs> Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering uh -huh, and, and come into his court. So, so an offering, Mr. Goreba Show, that's your, <laughs> that's your new name, <laughs> Mr. Goreba, Goreba Show. Anyways, I'm, just, I'm sorry. He, he makes me laugh. He interrupts the flow with his organ show, whatever he said. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. So it says an offering enables us to come properly into the courts. But then it says something else. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Uh, it completes worship because mm. it's all tied up together. So number one, when we give, we give him glory. When we give, we are enabled to properly enter his courts. And when we give, we complete our worship with giving. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and thank you for what's coming your way. Come on. The ocean is coming. Remember? The ocean is coming. The blessings of God are coming your way with such abundance. Such glorious abundance. Help me there on the instruments, please. With such abundance, it's beyond, way beyond. Dear choir, get ready to sing something, will you? Where's that list, dear, dear Pastor Chris? Where's that list, please? 
I want you. Yeah, uh, please stand up. You know what? You are so good. I'm going to take you with me in my luggage. Stand up. <laughs> I'm going to have to buy a lot of luggage. Anyways, lift your hands and pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on. Thank, thank God for what he's, he's about to bring you away. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be your name. I want you to sing Monarch of the Universe because you're going to reign with him there. Did you hear what I said? He is the king of the universe. You're going to reign with him one day. And I'm asking you to get to the phones. I'm asking you to right now do what the Bible says. Let's give him glory. Let's tell him that he can trust us with more in the spirit. Higher places in the spirit. Jesus said, if you cannot be trusted with filthy mammon, who can trust you with true riches? Hallelujah. True riches are coming your way. Greater days than you've ever known in your life. I'm going to tell you something. Only you who are givers will be taken care of in this life, in the natural. The day will come. Trust me, the day will, the, the day will come. God will multiply everything you touch. Just like that meal of the little boy in Galilee. Things will show up in your life that have never been there. God Almighty will do the incredible. The most amazing things are coming to you. But let's finish well. Stronger than ever. Better than ever. Stronger than when we began as believers. In all we do for him. In our loving, in our serving, in our worship, in our ministry, and in our giving. For his glory. Only for his glory. Give what is due to him. To glorify him, it says in the Psalms. And then he said, come into his courts with an offering. And worship in the beauty of holiness. So get to the phones now. And say, dear Jesus, I love you. Express your love through giving. Express your adoration through giving. Right now, do it. Nothing. Nothing will stop the blessings from coming your way. There's a, there's a great anointing flowing here. Do you feel it? It's flowing here. This is the time to sow. This is the time to sow. Lord, I worship you and love you. I'm not connected to this world. Every time you give, you declare, this world is not my home. No, I'm not attached to the things of the natural. You call that number and do it. While the choir sings, monarch of the universe. Come on, let's go. Calling. Keep giving.
Hallelujah. Would you just lift your hands in the presence of the living God? For He is great and greatly to be praised. Lord Jesus, to you the glory and the honor belong. And we thank you for your presence. Thank you for the integrity of your word. And we thank you for the intelligent Holy Spirit who is with us and in us. Thank you for these moments in purpose and destiny. Grant unto us now that we might speak as the oracles of God to the heart of the matter, to the center of the things which concern your people. For they are your inheritance in the earth in the name of Jesus, and if you agree with that, just say, it is so. Amen. God bless you. Thank God for this moment. Choir, you may be seated. Thank you. Thank you, musicians. To our beloved man of God, Pastor Chris, we honor you, sir. And we are grateful for the privilege and the opportunity of being here in this great time of ministry. And to Pastor Benny, how we love you, sir, and appreciate you. And thank God for your life and ministry. And to these other great men of God that have already been saluted, who are friends and brothers both. We want to share something that I believe uh, is significant in this moment, and I believe it is not only apropos to the things that Pastor Benny was sharing and the level of ministry that he was dispensing, but I believe it is significant in a very practical way because I believe with all of my spirit that this week uh, the Spirit of Grace wants to take us somewhere. I believe God is desiring to get His church globally to a certain place, not geographically, but spiritually. And when I had the privilege on yesterday of sharing at the great uh, Love World Convention Arena, when I was standing there, uh, Pastor Kay, I, I saw... Uh, a, an advert, I saw a piece of material that talked about five days of destiny. Five days of destiny, and I believe these, these are those days that we are in as they have been announced uh, and declared. And I, I am convinced that all this week, destinies are going to be affirmed. They are going to be confirmed. I believe some will be corrected. Destinies will be corrected. I believe things will be brought to fruition because I am certain, as Pastor Benny was sharing, that the Spirit of God is wanting to bring His people to a level of not only understanding, but a level of moving with Him in cooperation with His plans and purposes in these uh, last days. And so I want you to go with me to Genesis 22. I want to begin reading there uh, because the Spirit of grace impressed this upon me very uh, strongly as I was inquiring of him what my part would be. And I'm always uh, amazed at how the thread of the Spirit amongst these brethren always ties things together. And even though we do not converse or dialogue or talk about what we shall share of the Spirit of God, always brings it together in a magnificent way. I want you to read with me verse number 9, Genesis 22. And we're dropping into the encounter of Abram, uh, Abraham with, uh, with God uh, in the 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis as he is preparing to, uh, to sacrifice his son Isaac at the direction 
of God. And it's a very interesting thing. We know uh, that ultimately he does not perform that sacrifice. It's always been interesting to me, uh, uh, Bishop Dan, that, that God gives Abra- Abraham this instruction. Uh, God is not a God of human sacrifice. He's, he's not a God of child sacrifice. And yet he gives Abraham this instruction. And so we're going to drop right down there and we'll read. Then he came, then they came rather, verse 9, to the place of which God had told him. Will you say that out loud after me? The place of which God had told him. Yeah. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And so he said, here I am. And he, that is God, said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Very interesting there. Before I I read on, one of the things that always impacts me about this is most Christians would have killed Isaac because God told them to. Uh, what we have here is a God of progressive revelation, a God who continues to speak. One day he says this to Abram, Abraham, the next day he says don't do it because God is up to something. Wave at me if you understand what I just said if you're in here. Okay. And so he says, for now I know that phrase also impacts me greatly every time I read it. Because we're dealing with an omniscient God who now tells this man, now I know. So has God just discovered something? Has God just found something out? If you read the, uh, the, the text in the original language, what you find is when God says here, now I know, what he's actually articulating, uh, this word no means to ascertain by seeing or something seen or demonstrated as an action that causes or releases something else. So when God says, now I know, he's not saying, now I have found out something about you, Abraham. He is saying, in essence, now by your action, you have released me to get involved. You have actually released me to begin to perform what I have purposed. Now I know that you reverence or fear God since you have not withheld your son your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him. Everybody say there behind him. Also important. There behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horn. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of Isaac, his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide or Jehovah Jireh or Yad Hevav Yireh. He calls the name of the place the Lord will provide. Everybody say the name of the place. He called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing. This, 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 because you have done this thing. The inference being, without this thing, some other thing wouldn't be happening. I need you to pay attention to God's word. Because you've done this thing, stay with me. Because you've done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you. What an interesting construction of language, both in English and in the original Hebrew. Blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply. It's very interesting because God could have said, because you've done this thing, Reverend Tom, I'm going to bless you. God could have said, Pastor Kay, because you've done this thing, I'm going to multiply you. But what God actually says is, because you've done this, blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. What he's actually communicating is, because you have done this thing, 
I will not be able to bless and exclude you. I will not be able to multiply and you not get in on it. In other words, you have made yourself indispensable to my cause and to my move. If anything is going to happen, you're going to be included. You're going to be in on it. How about you say, I want to be in on it. I want to be in on whatever God is purposed to do. And so what just happened here, he says, blessing, I will bless you. Multiply, I will multiply you as the stars of heaven, as the sand of the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. I was reading this not long ago, uh, Pastor Chris, and as I was reading it, the, the Spirit of the Lord arrested me, and he said, son, pay attention to my words. He said, the Bible says Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. And the Spirit of Grace said to me, he said, Son, Jehovah Jireh is not just a covenant name of mine. It is that. And don't get me wrong. Don't misquote me. Jehovah Jireh is one of God's covenant names. But the Lord said to me, he said, Notice what I wrote here in the Scripture. He says he called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, and the Spirit of Grace said to me, he said, son, Jehovah Jireh is not just a covenant name of mine. Jehovah Jireh is a place in me. It, it, it is a spiritual location in our walk with God. It is a place that you get to in God as you walk with him. And notice what he says. He says, uh, he called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord at a certain place of elevation at a certain place of revelation you begin to see all your need is met everything you have is from God and nothing that you need will you ever lack again you begin to see that your God is in in exhaustible supplier ah, you will not lack or want for any good thing you, you get to the place Jehovah Jireh even if you have a major need even if you have a significant conflict even if you have something that is staring you in the face and defying you you don't sweat it you don't worry about it you don't stay up at night you don't you don't contemplate failure because you know that 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 you know your need is met it is a place, somebody say, it is a place in God. And look at your neighbor and say, and I'm going there. How about you? I'm, I'm on my way there. Now, many, many are there. Many, many are there. Many are there. And, and God, I really believe this with all my spirit, that it is the will of God that in these last days, his sons and daughters all collectively come into this place where we are absolutely certain that no need will go unmet. No Goliath of lack will be able to intimidate us. No circumstance or situation will be able to, to, to intimidate us. And I really believe with all my spirit, that's what the place that Pastor Benny was talking about, where we're at a place where the material needs are, are, are paled in the light of the glory of God and the purpose of God for us in these last days. I don't know about you. I'm on my way, and I want to land there in the name of Jesus. I believe with all my spirit that there are men and women watching me tonight. There are men and women listening to me tonight that are going in these next several days are going to arrive at that place. I believe there are pastors and ministers, apostles and prophets and teachers throughout the nations that are going to land in this place and many of God's people as well. Now, the question is, how do you get there? Because the Bible says very clearly 
that Abraham came to the place God had told him. It's also interesting to me if you read verse number 13, it says, Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns, and that is the ram that he sacrifices in place of his son. Very interesting uh, that it is the ram caught by the horns that is a type of the substitutionary sacrifice. A lot of people don't understand why the Hebrews blow the shofar, which is a ram's horn. Every time a Hebrew uh, uh, blows a shofar, they are heralding the reality of the substitutionary sacrifice that Yeshua is. That's why it begins every feast and every festival. It is a ram's horn. Now stay with me because I'm going somewhere with this. How does Abram get there? And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, he said, son, the, the, there, there are elements of getting to this place, and I want to show you, and I want you to share a few of these elements with my people. I will not be able to exhaust them all, but I will get to the three major things the Spirit of grace sh- had me to share with you. Go with me quickly to uh, Genesis chapter number 11. Let's go back to Genesis 11 very quickly. I want you to see something there. Genesis chapter number 11. And I'm going to read just the last couple of verses of Genesis 11, and then I'm going to go into Genesis 12, which is very familiar to most Bible readers and most believers. But I want to read in Genesis 11 first, verse 31. And it says, And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, of his daughter-in-law Sarai, the son of Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, this is after his father Terah dies, and we've just been told that that, that, uh, Terah and Abram is of Ur of the Chaldees, of Mesopotamia, and so he is now about to encounter this God, Jehovah, this God, El Shaddai. His father is dead, and so after the death of his father, the Bible says, that the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. Make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you, all of the families, and the Hebrew there is mishpaka, which doesn't mean just everyone who comes from your loins or your lineage. It actually means everyone who comes into your class or into your Order, not class like upper class, lower class, middle class, but class like university class or school class. Everyone who begins to learn to function like you. Everyone who begins to walk by the principles I will reveal to you. Everyone who is of your faith. Everyone who begins to act upon my word like you. I will bless all the families of the earth. In it, are you listening to me? This is why Jesus said, go and make disciples, uh, disciplined followers of every nation, ethnic group. Why? Because anybody, black, white, yellow, red, who learns to walk by the principles of the word come into Abraham's family. Abraham's class according to the spirit. And so he says, Get away from your country and from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And therein is the first element of getting to the place Jehovah Jireh. The first element of getting to the place Jehovah Jireh is separation. It is a separation from that which is familiar, from that which is known. God did not tell Abram to get away 
from his family, his father's house, his country, because God didn't like Abraham's family. He didn't tell him to leave because he didn't like his country. He didn't tell him to get away because he didn't like his kinfolk. Some of you may not like your kinfolk, but God loves them anyway. No, he didn't tell him to separate because of dislike. He told Abram to separate because Abram has just encountered this great God, Jehovah. He has just come into relationship with El Shaddai. And God has a purpose for Abraham. And what he's saying to Abraham is, I am separating you for the purpose of getting some things into you that when I tell you to do them, when I tell you to act on them, I cannot have your mama or your kinfolks in your ear telling you this won't work. That won't happen. Nobody in your family, Abram, has ever done this. Nobody in your, uh, in your lineage has ever done this. You've got to understand something. If you and I are going to get to the place Jehovah Jireh, if we're going to walk in that place with God, we have got to separate ourselves from the beggarly elements of this world, the principles of this world, and learn the principles of the kingdom of God, and the separation is for the purpose of revelation. I'm going to say that again. The separation is for the purpose of revelation. Whenever God is going to take you or I to another dimension or another level. He will oftentimes begin to remove things from around us and move us away from things. Why? Not because he doesn't necessarily like our environment, but because he does not want anyone interfering with his instruction, his communication, and his revelation to you. Is anybody listening to the preacher? He says in Isaiah 55 and verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. What is God saying? The way I get things done and the way you get things done are not the same. The way I prosper you, the way I increase you, the way I cause you to walk in victory, and the way you would do it are not the same. And so he separates Abraham. Now what happens when he separates Abraham, he begins to walk with him in the day-to-day -day elements and attributes of his life. To the degree, this is so glorious, to the degree that Abram begins, as he walks with God, before the conclusion of the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis, where Abram has just met God. Before the conclusion of that chapter, the Bible says in verse number 8 that Abraham moved from a place where there was famine. He pitched his tent in Bethel on the west of Ai, and there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. He's just met this God. He's not been... He's not been Walking with him for years, Pastor Benny. He's, he's not been going. There is no synagogue to go to to learn about him. There is no church to attend to learn about him. Abram is walking with God. And as he walks with God, God is giving Abram principles, instructions, concepts, ideas, as God says, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts, but as, my, as, the, as the snow comes down from heaven and the rain and waters the earth and returns not there, but makes it to bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be. What did God just tell you? When his word comes down, his thoughts come down. When his word comes down, his ways come down. God's thoughts and God's ways are in his word. Why is that important? Because the word of God and the instruction of God when it is given to us is the means and the mechanism 
by which we get from where we are to wherever God wants us to be. You get nothing in this kingdom by pursuing it. Everything in this kingdom is appropriated by pursuing him. I'm going to say that again. You get nothing in this kingdom by pursuing it. Everything in this kingdom is procured by the pursuit of him. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that the Gentiles, all these things that people with no covenant with God seek will be added to you. He didn't even say you'd have to work for it. He said it'd be added to you. So Abram begins to walk with God. I want you to see something here that's powerful. Abram begins to walk with God. And two chapters after Abram has met God, we see Abram, oh, don't miss this. We see Abram do something that no one else in Scripture has ever done. We see Abram act and take an action that no one else in Scripture has ever done. Let's go there real quickly. Go to Genesis chapter 14. And for the sake of time, I will not rehearse the totality of the event, but most of you that are listening to me are aware of the fact that Lot goes with Abraham. Lot is Abraham's nephew. Lot is captured. His things are captured. There's a war in the land, four kings against five, and in that warfare, Lot, Abram's nephew, is taken captive. Abram goes with 300 plus of his own household. I love this story. 300 bakers, butlers, and chauffeurs <laughs> trained in his house. Somebody say under the anointing. Somebody say under the blessing. So there's a testimony right there. When you got people under the blessing, you can beat whole armies. You may not look like you have enough, but if you've got people trained under the blessing, you can do supernatural things with less than people expect. The Bible says Abram went with men trained in his own house and took Lot back, got all his stuff back, and once he has the victory, let's drop down Genesis 14, verse number 18. The Bible says he, after the defeat, and he has gotten the spoil back, not only lots, but the spoil of that warfare. It says, verse 18, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High God. So this is the priest of the God Abraham just met a couple of chapters ago. Are you in the room with me or what? He's the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Bless me, Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and bless me, God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, that is Abram, gave him, that is Melchizedek, a tithe, a mahasra in Hebrew, a tenth of all. Bishop Payne no one had ever done that. No one had ever tithed. Are you listening to me, choir? No one had ever given God that we know of in Scripture a Mahasra. Now, the principle of a portion designated to God goes all the way back to the garden. In, in, in Adam, it was the tree. In Cain and Abel, it was the first. In Noah, it was the seven clean animals that he sacrificed after he came out of the ark. But no one had ever Mahasra. No one had ever tithed. So this is something. I need someone to hear me. This is something that God gave to Abraham between Genesis 12 and Genesis 14. And we know that he did, watch this, because when the king of Sodom 
approaches Abram and says, listen, you don't have to do this. Just take all the stuff and keep the goods for yourself. Look at verse number 22. It says, but Abram, Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing. In other words, Abram is saying this. There was an encounter between him and God that is not recorded in Scripture. Where God told Abraham, now this is a principle of walking with me. This is a principle of the blessing. This is a principle of increase. That you bring me the mahasra, you bring me the tithe. It is amazing to me. Especially right now. Bishop Payne in the, in the church in the West, Pastor Chris. Right now in the church in the West because there was an emphasis on the message of grace. There are preachers and pastors who are telling their congregations that they don't need to tithe. That tithing is under the law. Tithing is old covenant. I want you to pay attention to something. God gives to Abram the principle of tithing before there is a covenant. I need you to hear me. He doesn't cut covenant with Abram till the next chapter. Genesis 15. So before there is a covenant, old or new, Are you here? Before there is a covenant, old covenant or new covenant, Galatians tells us that the law was added some years after because of transgression. And the law being taken away cannot annul the promise or the covenant God made. And so the tithe, giving to God, is a basic foundational principle of walking in the blessing. I need you to hear me. Don't you let anybody convince you. Don't you let, I don't care if they've got a diamond stick pin and a pinky ring. I don't care if they've got five degrees. Don't you let anyone convince you that the tithe is old covenant or the tithe is under the law. The tithe is before a covenant was even made. Which means, which means this principle of offering to God is so foundational and so fundamental to walking in the blessing of God that before God even makes a covenant with Abraham, he talks to him about this. And Abraham says, listen, I've already raised my hand to God. I don't care what you say. This God who told me he would bless me and increase me told me to do this. A lot of people say, well, you know, we don't have to tithe, and I'm not preaching on tithing, but I'm in it, so I might as well stay in it for a minute. A lot of people say, well, you know, we'll, uh, the, the Bible says if you don't tithe Malachi 3, you're cursed with a curse. And because we are already blessed in Christ Jesus, then we cannot be cursed with a curse. Well, you're almost right. You, you, you know no, just enough scripture to be dangerous. Because the covenant is not just that you will be blessed. The covenant is that you will be blessed and be a blessing. So just because you are blessed in Christ Jesus doesn't mean that you are continuing to be a blessing to other people. You cannot be a blessing without giving. You didn't hear what I just said. You can be blessed without tithing. You can be blessed without sowing, but you cannot be a blessing without tithing and you cannot be a blessing without sowing and if you are not a tither or a sower the reality is you're selfish and you're just thinking of your four and no more God wants you to participate with him in blessing the whole earth you missed a good place to yell I said you missed a good place to yell.
If you study the origin of the curse, the word curse actually means to have the disregard of. In the original Hebrew, there are two Hebrew words, arar, morar. It literally means to have the disregard of. If you notice, oh God, I didn't mean to get into this. If you notice, when Adam breaks the principle of honoring God with the tithe, are you there? God says to Adam, cursed is the ground for your sake. Notice, he doesn't curse Adam. He can't curse Adam because he's already blessed Adam. And not even God can curse what he's already blessed. So he says to Adam, cursed is the ground in relation to you. Now why? Why? Pay attention. This is important. Why? Because God put the blessing on Adam. He did not put the blessing on the earth. Let me say that again. God did not bless the earth. He blessed Adam. And he expected Adam. Yeah, you're with me. And he expected Adam to take that blessing and bless the rest of the earth with it. And with the blessing, the earth had to respond to Adam the same way it responded to God. You're not listening. With the blessing, the earth had to respond to Adam the same way it responded to God. And so when Adam broke the principle of honoring God with his substance, God said, now the earth has the right to disregard you. The earth does not have to respond to you the way it responds to me. Are you getting this choir? That's why when Jesus got up in the hinder part of a ship in a storm and rebuked the wind and said to the wave, be still. The disciples scratched their heads and said, what manner of man is this? Here's the answer. It's the manner of man you and I are supposed to be if we walk in the blessing of God. Somebody say separation. Say revelation. What are you saying? If you and I are going to get to the place, Jehovah Jireh, if you and I are going to get to the place where not only are all our needs met, but we are absolutely certain that no matter what situation or circumstance we get into, the need will be met and overflow. We will be able to see it. We are going to have to learn to do what God instructs no matter who says. That's not for today. That doesn't work. That's not biblical. That devil is a liar. Do you hear me? And in this last day, God wants his church to know this is a part of getting to the place, Jehovah Jireh, the the, the tithe, the mahasra, and the offering, the minka, the apportionment in Hebrew. These are God's manner of walking in the fullness of of the blessing. Oh, maybe tomorrow I'll talk a little bit about what that blessing actually is and how it operates. But here, hear me very clearly. Everybody's a separation. In other words, if you're going to get to the place, Jehovah Jireh, you've got to be willing to leave some things that look familiar. You've got to be willing not to lean to your own understanding. You've got to be willing to break away from normality, from mediocrity, from what everyone else is doing. Hear what the Spirit of God is telling you and do it. Everybody say separation. Everybody say revelation. God gives to Abram this revelation of honoring him with substance. Isn't this amazing? Before he makes covenant with him, he gives him this revelation. Before He performs everything he's promised. He gives him this revelation. Why? Because he's going to speak to him. Would you, I got people 
in here, would you just lay your hand on somebody real quickly right now? If you're watching me and you're with somebody, lay your hand up on them. If you're by yourself, you can lift your hand up. But if you're talking to somebody, look at them and tell them in these next several days, the Spirit of God is going to speak to you to do some things that nobody in your family has ever done, that nobody in your lineage has ever done, that none of your business partners have never done, that you never learned in school. God is going to speak to you to do something. And when you do it, the blessing is going to break out all over everything you have. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Woo. Hey, glory, excuse me. I'm almost finished. Hey, glory, excuse me. Hallelujah. And when he tells you to do it, doesn't matter if he tells you to do it in prayer, if he tells you to do it in Bible study, if he tells you to do it while I'm preaching or Pastor Dan is preaching or Bishop Payne is preaching or Pastor Benny or Pastor Chris or Mike Small, whenever he tells you to do it, God sends, you know, well, I don't know if I can hear God like that. Let me help you. <laughs> when God sends Elijah to the widow woman, he says, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain you. But when Elijah gets to the widow woman, it is clear she has heard nothing. Do I have any Bible readers here? It is clear that she has been told nothing. He comes to her and finds out, she finally identifies clearly by the Spirit which woman it is because there were a lot of widows in Zarephath. Jesus said that. So he's supernaturally led to the one that he's to minister to. Are you here? And then he says, listen, go get me some water. She says, okay, Man of God, I'll get you some water. Hey, hey, while you're going, go get me, get me a cake. Oh, man of God. Hey, wait a minute. Water, cool. I'll give you some water, but I don't have any bread. Are you there? So clearly, she has heard nothing. From God. You know when she hears God? When a man under the anointing of the Spirit of the Lord looks at her and says, Thus saith the Lord, Go and make me a cake first. Then she heard God. And she moved. She heard God when a man under the anointing spoke to her. I'm almost done yelling at you, I promise. So you may not hear God tell you to sow this or that, but a man under the anointing of God may stand up here tomorrow night or Wednesday night or Thursday night or Friday and say, thus says the Lord. What you got to know yeah, is if a man under the anointing says it, the glory of God is on that word. The power of God is on that word. The blessing of God is on that word. The anointing of God is on that word. When you act on that word, the life of that word will break out and hit everything you have. Somebody shout hallelujah. I'm finished. I got about three minutes. And then I'm going to give you an instruction, the last thing. We've already read it, so I don't need to go back. Well, I'll read one piece of it because it's important. Genesis 22. Abram, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Abram is told by God, oh, children, don't miss this. Because, see, sometimes we read this stuff. And we just read past it, Reverend Tom. Sometimes we read it, Pastor Kay, and we just read past it. We don't put ourselves in the Scripture. We don't understand that this is a man learning the ways of God just like us. So God tells Abram, okay, take your son. 
your only son. It's interesting he says your only son because Abram has another one. I don't have time. But what God is telling you is you can't just give God anything you want to give him. You got to give him what he asks for. When he asks for it, that's the only thing he'll accept. When he asks, you may have two or three of them, but if God says that one, that's the only one that is going to satisfy him. Just give me your son, your only son. Take him and offer him up. And Abram has to walk with this son that he has believed for for years. A son that hadn't come for 24 years of waiting. And finally, when God speaks to him, another thing which I can't get into today, he receives him in a year's time. Now he's got to take that boy. And God says, I want you to sacrifice him. Not him, God. Not my most precious seed. Not the very best thing you've ever given me. Not the greatest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, that. I want you to take your son and I want you to offer him up. I believe with all my heart. I, I, don't, have, I don't have scripture right now to prove it, but I believe with all my heart. I believe when God found a man who would give his son, God was then to release. God was then released to manifest his son. Because when God finds a man in the earth who is willing to do in the earth what God is willing to do from heaven, He will hold nothing. I'm almost done. The Bible says he said, take him, Abram does. And when he's about to slay him, God says, oh, you don't have to do it. You know what? Write this down. When you are willing to give God the very best that you have, God will see to it that you will never do without it. You didn't hear what I just said. When you are willing to give God the very best you have, God will see to it that you will never do without it. If you're willing to give God a $1,000 seed, he'll see to it that you'll never do without it. If you're willing to give God a car, he'll see to it you never do without one. Why? Because whatever a man sows that, I'm done here. The Bible says when Abram took the very best seed he had at the word of God. Everybody say at the word of God. And offered it. God said, because you have done this thing. And I wanted you to say it. There is an action of elevation. Say this after me. There is an action of elevation. That once you act on it, once you perform it, you will be set in a place from which there is no return. I believe with all of my heart that this week, God is going to ask you and I to give him something that is that thing that is going to cause you to go into a dimension in God from which you will never lack. Here's what I want you to do. I've got just a couple of minutes. Listen to me. Give me a little music, if you will, son. Listen to me right where you are. I'm not going to tell you what to give. But I'm going to tell you by the Spirit of God, my time with God this afternoon, he said, I want you to tell every individual watching you that tonight God wants you to offer something to him that represents your best, your best, the best you have, if you've got a hundred dollars, fifty dollars and five, the hundred's your best, if you've got a thousand naira, five hundred naira, and two hundred naira, the thousand is your best, I'm not going to tell you tonight what to give, I'm simply going to say to you that this week the Spirit of God has set an appointment with your destiny. And if you will act upon his word when he speaks it to you, beginning tonight, there are men and women under the sound of my voice that are going to be set in a place 
For you're not only blessed, you are a supernatural blessing. And you are increasing on every side. Right now, right where you are, I want you to get ready to sow and give into this great move of the Spirit. I believe the details will come on the screen even after we go off the air. Even when this meeting closes, the Spirit of grace is going to be dealing with hearts and lives. Would you lift your hands all over this room right where you are right now? I want you, sir. I want you, ma'am. Under the anointing of the Spirit, you say, man of God, I haven't heard God say anything to me. Well, then let me just say this to you. Right where you are, I want every person under the sound of my voice who can in faith to get a seed, to get a seed, a seed and sow it that represents another level of giving to God. Even if it's a dollar more than you've ever given, even if it's a dollar more, a naira more, than you think you can afford. I want you to take a step of faith right now. A step of believing. Because I tell you now, and I am prophesying, as a prophet of God, I declare to you that this week, the Spirit of God is going to bring thousands of believers into the place, Jehovah Jireh, where there is not only no lack, but where there is No doubt, no concern, no anguish, no fear. When you're faced with an obstacle, I feel the Holy Ghost. When you're faced with an obstacle, when you're faced with a challenge, you will rest. You will rest knowing that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know there is no way. I will be made ashamed. As a matter of fact, I want you to lift your hands right now and say that there is no way. I shall be made ashamed. Say it out loud. There is no way I shall be made ashamed. There is no way I shall not come out of this. There is no possibility that you will lack anything you have need of as you act. As you act act on the word of the Lord. Right now, right now, I want you to get ready to sow. I think the information is going up on screens. There are ways for you to sow. There are ways for you to give. Sir, I am talking to you. Ma'am, I am speaking to you. Young man, under the anointing of the Spirit of God, I am speaking to you. You may be the only one in your family, the only one in your lineage, the only one in your community, the only one in your village steps into this place but you sir you ma'am are stepping into it and I have it on divine authority you will never go back to a lower level if you will act on God's word tonight and this week lift up your hands father I pray for every man every woman every boy every girl every family every preacher Every apostle, every prophet, every man or woman of God that is overseeing the work of ministry in this hour, I pray tonight that not one person under the sound of my voice misses getting to the place, Jehovah Jireh, in the name of Jesus. If you agree with it, just begin to lift your hands and worship God. Just begin to lift your hands and worship the Lord. Just begin to lift them and worship the Lord. These are your days of destiny. These are your days. These are your moments. I know, come come on, lift your hands and just pray in the Spirit just a moment. Man of God, I'm, I'm going to yield it to you, sir. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory. Thank you. Dearest Shepherd,
Make sure to join us again tomorrow. Beautiful sessions. And of course, right after, you have the opportunity to watch the previous sessions back to back. And then join us in the morning session and the evening session tomorrow. I pray that the seeds of faith that you give today we multiply it, return to you in a great harvest, and your faith will produce results in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lebro so caramande kila capra sede que sedes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We'll do that part of the chorus again and then we'll say good night to you.